Well, hey everybody, it's Wes Hagen, and welcome to uh, Day Drinking with Wes Hagen. It is a beautiful Wednesday, uh, June 24th, if I'm not mistaken, or if my brain hasn't completely left my body. Uh, and it is, of course, the wonderful and terrible year 2020. Um, hopefully this will be uh, part of the uh, historical record of, of how people got through uh, quarantine by you know, basically uh, uh, inventing wine shows and talking to all you wonderful people. So thank you so much for being here. It looks like Nick is uh, coming on, so thank you for being here, Nick. Uh, as always, we meet at 5 o'clock on, in, uh, excuse me, on Facebook Live a little bit earlier. We uh, hang out for a couple minutes uh, beforehand at 4.45, and then I bring the folks in uh, on Instagram right at 5 o'clock. And we usually finish up right around, right around, you know, sometime between 5.45 and, and uh, 6 o'clock. Uh, as always, if you have questions that you would like or uh, subjects you would like me to take on in the show, you can always put them on my Facebook pages. You can send them to me Instagram. I'm always looking for ideas. I do keep the show kind of planned about two to three weeks out to make sure that I have all the wine and all the uh, all the information that I need. So, oh, Jolie's back. Good to see you, Jolie. I hope uh, everything is well with you. And uh, Nick and John, uh, fantastic. And um, uh, Jolie, are you, uh, are you at home? And of course, if you are drinking, I always like to know what you're sipping on. You always seem to uh, find delicious and wonderful things that I don't know of. And by the way, Jolie, um, there is a brewery. You should probably know um, uh, a gentleman um, named Eddie Gray. And you might already know Eddie. He's kind of a, he's in, he's a, a salesperson for American Wine and Spirits. Works, he's furloughed right now for Southern, uh, for, uh, Southern Wine and Spirits. But he also is a part owner of a brewery called Pacific Plate, and I've really been enjoying their beers. I'd love to see what you uh, what you think, and I, I think that it's someplace uh, not too far from uh, uh, from out where you live. So there's there's a little uh, a little interest in in what's going on, and I always uh, love to see uh, folks come in and I uh, haven't talked to in a while. So uh, also so tonight, what are we doing? We're going to be uh, drinking and talking a little bit about bar the Barrel Burner Chardonnay uh, 2016. Uh, the 2017 is just about to come out, so I've got lots and of delicious 2016 that I can taste with you guys. It's still on the market, so it's a good chance if you find Barrel Burner um, out anywhere um, uh, outside of the Miller Family Wine Company or MillerFamilyWines.com where you can, I believe, get the 17 already, but uh, the 16 is in a really, really beautiful place. So this is uh, not me doing the formal evaluation. This is me pouring a delicious glass of wine and sharing it with all uh, of you fine folks. So thank you for, uh, for tuning in. Appreciate it. Hope something delicious is in your glass. And um, what else are we talking about today? Well, after we talk a little bit about the Barrel Burger Chardonnay, uh, I'm going to jump into a little bit of a history of the use of wooden and specifically oak barrels in the production of wine within the history. So there'll be a historical perspective from about 2,500, about 5,000 years ago uh, when the first archaeological evidence of, uh, of barrels appeared. Uh, they weren't quite barrels, and I'll be explaining that to you, all the way up to uh, the barrels basically I bought last year. So uh, we're going to have a, a nice 4,500 uh, year, 4,600 year, 4,700 year spread of, of exactly where barrels come from. So looking forward to that. Let me wet my whistle a little bit. Oh, whew. I have to I have to say I think that this week is actually moving slower. What I have found over the last maybe 12 weeks or however let's see so uh, two weeks in March, 6, April, 10, May. Yeah, about the last 13, 12 to 13 weeks. Maybe it's the 13th week and maybe that's why maybe that's why it seems like it's been slowing down but um, certainly at the beginning, um, sort of because we didn't know hardly much of anything about, uh, about sort of quarantine, uh, we, we kept it, you know, obviously very, very careful. And as we're progressing through this, the fear that I have, especially as someone who might have more um, medical issues than, than 
other folks my age if they come down with this thing. It seems like people are seeing this as sort of uh, an either or digital thing. It's either zero or one. It's either I'm home or I'm not home. And when I'm, I'm not home, I'm acting like this is all okay. And I think we're seeing a really, really big issue with that. So one thing I really want to um, focus on and, and talk about a little bit is to make sure that we don't completely and uh, utterly burn out, which means that instead of either being sequestered by ourselves or out in the world having fun and you know taking pictures and proving to you know I think Facebook and um, some of the social media stuff can be a little bit um, dangerous as well because everyone who uh, you know has multiple thousands and thousands or millions of followers on social media basically wants everyone to be jealous of everything that they're doing. It's hard for the world to be jealous of you uh, being sequestered or being in a mask. I, I don't care. Um, I want to be. I want to be sequestered. I want to be quarantined right now because I know that that's the safest thing for me and my family. Um, it's it's a tough it's a tough road to hoe though, right? It's, it's a tough road to hoe, not a road to hoe. That sounds a little bit different, but um, I'm you know I, I was really sort of a little bit um, kind of beat down and depressed a couple weeks ago when I just felt, and I'm I'm still not feeling like perfectly you know that the world is safe and right, but. Uh, you know, between uh, between a global pandemic and uh, sort of uh, the racial unrest within this country, I kind of was thinking, gosh, it's just like the most, you know, the most vulnerable people in this world right now are the, are just getting screwed. Um, you know, the vulnerable, you know, back in the day where basically might made right, and if you couldn't step up and protect yourself against other tribes, other things, you know, back 10, 20, 100,000 years ago, that was something, but you know, human beings for and pre-humans. If you look back to the history of pre-humans, Homo habilis, um, millions of years ago, pre-humans used to take care of each other. There is fossil evidence two and a half million years ago of of hominids that had uh, a male hominid had broken its leg in some type of a large game hunt with the men, broke his leg and no longer could hunt because they knew because of the way that the bone basically, you know, basically was found after, um, they knew that he was alive probably 25 years after the injury. So there's really only one possibility, and that was that the tribe allowed a hobbled man who couldn't hunt to do other things in, uh, in, the, in the civilization, in the tribe. Um, so clearly, we have been offering reasonable accommodation to disabled people um, before we were human. So if you want to say that it somehow is weak to take care of the vulnerable, well, A, if you're a religious person, you didn't read your New Testament careful because obviously uh, there's a lot of love in the New Testament for the vulnerable, whether it's the poor, you know, whether it's the sick, whether, you know, obviously vulnerable people are um, extraordinarily vulnerable. And the, and, and the vulnerability extends into policing. The vulnerability extends into incarceration. Uh, the vulnerability certainly um, seems to be strongly influenced by the fact that young, healthy people don't seem to understand how this disease works. And this is my biggest problem. And you know I don't get too political on this show. And it's, when five o'clock hits, I'll get back to drinking. But uh, the biggest problem I'm really having right now is trying to understand why these people that seem to be the same people that gave us sort of pro-life really just don't give a shit anymore about life. They don't care about grandma. They want to go out and get their scrimps on and they want to go out there and you know get their drink on and hang out with their friends and pretend this never happened. Let's push the reset button and go to a fantasy land where uh, this virus doesn't kill people. And I'm not talking to the people that are healthy and young because you're right. You'll probably be okay. Congratulations for you. But do you know anyone who works at a hospital? Do you know anyone who works at an assisted care uh, facility? Do you know anyone who's immunocompromised? I mean, that's the issue. It's, it's about being careful and selfless and focused and understanding that this is temporary, that medical science is where we should be putting our hopes. Um, science and uh, research is, is, is so key right now to being right where we need to be. So this is kind of where I'm kind of going with this whole thing at this point is that how can I help support vulnerable communities from my house? Um, in, our, in the conversation with my wife this morning, um, she pointed out to me 
um, very clearly and uh, very effectively um, that all of my social media should, um, should be basically um, also saddled with um, uh, basically um, there's a way, what, what, what is it called? Accessibility. Accessibility. So if you take, if you, any, any uh, um, Facebook or Instagram post you do, if you use a hashtag, hashtag for accessibility and then use brackets to basically uh, give um, a description for people that are, uh, that are visually impaired, it will talk to them and show you what your post is. For example, I posted some pictures this morning or a short video of our bunnies, our little baby bunnies, and then in that post we would put and write down that it would be very important for visually impaired people. Part of, what's that? Captions. captions, yes, captions are obviously important. And the captions uh, for, you know, for maybe uh, hearing, uh, folks who have uh, hearing disabilities, but also um, we're really starting to think about other types of uh, disabilities. Maybe if I was on the road for 250 days out of the year, I wouldn't be thinking about these things. So maybe there is some value to finding roots and finding calmness and finding uh, what I found throughout this thing is A, uh, it's, it's getting me healthier because I'm working out more, because I'm at home, because I'm taking more walks, because now I'm, I'm able to go out to our parks and maybe throw some Frisbees around and uh, as long as I'm socially, uh, socially uh, sort of distanced. Um, so um, yeah, physically distanced may be even a better word because socially distanced means you could still be yelling and uh, singing and, and having a conversation with someone. Uh, loudly within that six feet. I would rather be physically distanced uh, and then socially distanced. Um, it's, it's more about the physical, right? I, I think that's important. All right, so what do we got here? We got uh, Bob is finishing off some of the 19 Smashberry Rosé from yesterday. Doesn't it drink really well the day after? I'm really happy about that. Um, and you're drinking the same wine at the same time. Oh, I like that. Um, and welcome, Dave, and welcome, Bob. As I was just kind of... Uh, um, sort of soliloquy, making a soliloquy on everything else. Yeah, the weeks are slowing down a little bit. Gosh, man, I will tell you, I've never had weeks go back so far. Because normally I'm in three or four different markets in two or three different states per week. So I'm always kind of moving and uh, I have travel days and then I have other days and then I just try to catch a breath and then just get back into it. And I've never, in the last five years, I've not had consistency in my life. Consistency of I wake up in my own bed. Consistency of I have a plan. I have somewhere to be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and it's home. It's it's very unusual, and uh, the way you know I'm seeing sort of the progression of of, of this disease and the uh, a potential vaccine. I, I see myself uh, here probably uh, at least through the end of the year, uh, and if I can get out, and there is a, a miracle um, of science, uh, you know, a scientific breakthrough of a vaccine, boy, I'm all in. But Boy, I'm just I'm just looking at this and thinking, there's something really, really calming and really, really um, special about the relationship that I've built um, with my wife, the relationship I've built with a number of you, the relationship that I'm learning through social media, the relationship I'm learning as a presenter, and now as a brand ambassador who works remotely. Which means, like for instance, today um, I used a new uh, a, a new uh, sort of uh, platform called Loom. We had Zoom, now we have to have Loom, and Loom allows a little picture of you to appear anywhere on any document to lead people through these documents and talk to them. So I learned a, a brand new uh, platform today and did a, and did a couple of uh, pitches uh, to Costco in Texas. So if you're wondering what the hell I do, and uh, I, I'm actually thinking about doing a show on sort of uh, day in the life, a uh, viticulturist, a winemaker, a brand ambassador, what do I do on a regular basis? And it's, it's all, not all that exciting, but I try to make it exciting at least for an hour a night. So let's bring in our friends uh, from old uh, Instagram. And we've got live going, and I just hit that button, right? And it's checking my connection. And I am now live on Instagram. So Instagram, welcome. Facebook folks, thanks for sticking with us. We're talking tonight about Chardonnay and barrels. We're going to be uh, having a great night tonight on uh, Day Drinking with Wes Hagen. Thank you for joining us. Remember, we're here Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 5 o'clock. Monday, general wine information. Wednesday, a deeper dive into either styles or uh, things about winemaking and the production of wine that you guys can uh, benefit by knowing uh, and being told by uh, a production winemaker such as myself. My name is Wes Hagen. I was a winemaker and vineyard manager at Clopepe for 20 years. 
And then I moved over to the Miller Family Wine Company in 2015, where I've been now. This will be my sixth vintage uh, with the Miller Family Wine Company, but really five full years on the job. Uh, let's see what else. Um, tonight, I really want to talk a little bit about this delicious 2016 Barrel Burner Chardonnay, which still might be in the market. You still might see this wine lurking around. And then because um, I wanted to saddle the Barrel Burner as a lead-in to a discussion on oak, uh, we've talked a little bit about oak in the use of winemaking, what flavors it gives, uh, what country the oak is from, a little bit of the history of oak, but I want to take a deep dive tonight, maybe 15 or 20 minutes, really on the oldest example of, of, of a circular vessel that was watertight or could uh, hold things, basically a staved, uh, um, a staved container that is basically held together by bands. So we're going to talk a little bit about tubs, we're going to talk a little bit about barrels, we're going to talk a little bit about fermentation, and we're going to talk a little bit about how oak, that, how oak influences that. And I will tell um, a number of um, uh, the people that I tell these stories to, they tell me it's one of their favorite stories, and that is how French oak sort of became uh, sort of the standard for high quality, high end wine in the world. And it's a funny story, it's a story uh, that involves uh, the French, it involves the Nazis, it involves the Hungarians, uh, it involves the Russians, it involves just about everybody, and it really, really does focus in on the end of World War II. So looking forward to that. So let's try drinking some wine. So A, I, of course, I always like to see who's here, and uh, cool, and I always want to make sure that, um, uh, fortunately, that all of you guys know what I'm drinking, 2016 Barrel Burner Chardonnay. Uh, this one was made by Clay Brock, who was the winemaker of the year in Paso Robles in 2010. Awesome dude, friend of mine, makes fantastic wines, and these barrel burner wines are fantastic. Um, I'm going to stick my nose in this, and we're going to talk a little bit about what I smell, and then uh, we're going to leverage that into a conversation uh, about, uh, about oak and wine. And I also would love to hear uh, if you are... Um, you're enjoying a 2018 Barrel Burner Cabernet Sauvignon that paired beautifully with the Beef Wellington. Oh man, Beef Wellington. So wow, the 17 Barrel Burner just tore through. We're already sold out of the 17 and we're into the 18. Uh, I was just showing the 16 six months ago. So thank you guys for buying in big to that Barrel Burner Cabernet. Love you, honey. Oh, my beautiful wife just hugged, just gave me a nice uh, air kiss and went away. So, um, And we are actually planning in a couple weeks, I believe, on, uh, wow, like July 17th. It'll be here before we know it. Uh, we're gonna do another uh, Wes and Chanda sort of um, live on Mondays, and we're gonna be talking about dogs and wine. So I will definitely collect a number of different uh, questions about, uh, about uh, what you guys wanna talk about with dogs and wine. It's not a combination of dogs and wine, although I see Jolie probably saying, yeah, dogs and wine. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about. Yep little bit little bit about service dogs a little bit about disability a li little bit about training service dogs my wife as you know probably know uh, Chanda has been training service dogs mm, probably at least 15, over 15 years yeah 15 years so she's got some skills in this so uh, that'll be really fun and then uh, I'll be posting uh, all the way through uh, mostly through all the way through July all of the subjects and all the wines that we're gonna be tasting so you guys can jump in get some of those wines we do have a promotion going on right now at MillerFamilyWines.com and that is as long as you buy six bottles of uh, basically um, anything but Jay Wilk so if you buy a uh, barrel burner uh, Ballard Lane or Smashberry wines and at least six pack uh, six bottles uh, we will ship all your wines you just use penny shipping all one word it's I think it's supposed to be all caps but whatever I don't know if that matters all caps, all one word, penny shipping, and that'll give you one cent shipping on six, a six pack to a 12 pack. I think it's one cent shipping, I think it's one cent per case, but I'm not exactly sure, but I know that six to 12 bottles will ship for one cent, which saves you a lot of money. And that gives you about, you know, the equivalent of about an additional 15 to 20% off of the extraordinarily low prices of these wines. So nothing on the list is really over 15 bucks. So you can, if you need some more wine, Go to MillerFamilyWines.com and use the penny shipping um, promo code. And that is uh, our 30 seconds of Strictly Commercial, as Mr. Uh, as Mr. Frank Zappa would say. All right, so let's, uh, let's get down to it. Let's get down to some day drinking. I'm a thirsty boy. Hmm. Is it oak-driven or is it fruit-driven? That is always a really big question, especially on a Chardonnay that is, has a name like Barrel Burner. 
Some of you have heard this story before about barrel burner and our attempts to put a lot of oak in this wine. And it goes back to another statement and we're talking all about barrels today. So I'll go back to that famous statement, which was attributed, I attribute it to Brian Babcock who told it to me, but someone once said they heard Mel Knox say it too. And Mel Knox um, basically is the guy who sells Francois Ferrer barrels, which are some of the greatest barrels in the world, made in St. Romain, uh, France. Uh, I've been to the factory where they make these barrels. It's absolutely fantastic and wonderful to watch them being, being made. Um, but uh, they said, uh, maybe Mel Knox, maybe Brian Babcock said, you can't over oak a wine, but you can underwine the oak. And I think this is really indicative of the beautiful fruit we grow at French Camp Vineyard in the uh, Paso Robles Highlands District. Because this wine tends to be very intense and very persistent, having a lot of character and a lot of flavor and a fair amount of extract. Um, it can soak up a lot of oak. So I would say if we tried to put this much oak in a Santa Maria Valley wine, say from Solomon Hills, it would completely take away from all of the amazing, delicious, elegant, mineral, saline character of the wine. Paso tends to make a bigger, richer, riper, closer to sort of pears and all these other uh, flavors that you would get out of a warmer climate with Chardonnay. So as a result, uh, when we first started making, this was the first barrel burner Chardonnay ever made, 2016, and it's still drinking extraordinarily well. Uh, we just piled the oak on. We just tried to give the equivalent of 50 to 75 percent uh, of, of, new, of new oak. And after we blended the wine, we actually added some more oak because it wasn't really there. And then we bottled the wine and we opened it up six months later and all of, almost 80% uh, of the oak had integrated. It had some beautiful oak in the nose, but certainly this is not an over-oaked wine. And we meant maybe to make it a slightly over-oaked wine for the people that really like that oaky, buttery, sort of marshmallowy style. Um, a, this wine has very uh, small amounts of residual sugar, probably down less than two grams. Most humans uh, can't taste residual sugar in wine uh, under three grams. Uh, and most, uh, on average, about four grams is where most people start picking it up. So this is half as much residual sugar as normally um, accessible and uh, detectable by the human palate. Definitely toasty on the nose. It hasn't integrated much more than it did when we first bottled it. So I'm getting a little brown butter, I'm getting a little nice toasty barrel character, uh, vanilla, some uh, spice box, fig, quince, Definitely, uh, definitely some uh, yellow plum. Maybe some really ripe, spicy pear. Um, for some reason, uh, it reminds me a little bit of uh, that clovey aroma that you get when you walk into a, a house around Christmas. That's making maybe some some spiced cider with oranges floating with the with the um, with the, uh, the little cloves of uh, what is it? I just uh, the clove the clove cloves. Cloves of clove in the, uh, I, I just completely and totally fooled myself. Um, cloves in the oranges, that's kind of what it reminds me of. But it also really just smells like delicious Central Coast Chardonnay with a, with a fair amount of oak influence. It's got some nice richness, little sweetness on the attack that completely disappears as it's supposed to do in Chardonnay. It should be rich, it should be ripe. It should show you some nice round character in the front, and then it should become a little angular in the finish. I love Chardonnays that show that um, uh, almost uh, an effusive uh, richness on the attack, and then in the mid palate and the finish, it plays this fun dance where what you think is almost a sweet wine basically goes into the back of the palate and into the finish as bone dry, high acid, Boom, there it is. It, it just refreshes the palate. It's almost like a meal. It's almost like biting something fatty and then taking a sip of wine to rinse your palate, but it's all in the wine. I think this is why Mont Rocher is the greatest white wine in the world. Um, I've, I've tasted some incredible Rieslings from Germany, from Austria, from Switzerland, certainly from Alsace, the Clos St. Hunes and the Cuvée St. Catharines and all those wonderful Trimbach wines. They are incredible that the greatest experience with white wine I've ever had has certainly been with Chardonnay. Not only did Clo Pepe grow some incredible Chardonnay, and I love making those wines and, and selling those wines, but if you've ever had a Mont Rocher with a little bit of age on it, it enters the mouth like, a, like, like the unctuousness and the uh, flavor profile of a sweet wine, of a dessert wine. And that's how powerful and ripe and special it is. And then as you taste it, you're like, oh my gosh, this is, is this a dessert wine? And all of a sudden, it just whacks the back of your mouth in the finish with just this beautiful, 
long mineral bone dry finish and it's like it's like an impossibility and really to spend twenty five hundred dollars on a bottle of white wine it better taste like an impossibility because it's almost impossible that I would spend three thousand dollars on a bottle of white wine but you know what uh, life's too short you know sometimes not to taste the greatest things to see the greatest things to experience the greatest things and sometimes uh, we all got to save up to have that magical experience you know save up five hundred bucks and go to the French Laundry, you know, um, save up you know, a little bit of extra money and fly someplace you've never been. Um, yes, I am bringing a bottle. Uh, yes, I'm breaking my own rule just for a second because uh, Karen asked me if I was going to bring a bottle to Rose's Luxury. Yes, uh, I am going to uh, pack up my beautiful wife, pack up my beautiful wine bag, and uh, we are coming to D.C. sometime soon. I don't know when uh, SOMCON is going to happen again. My guess is the next time I'm going to be in the D.C. area will probably be uh, doing another SOMCON when they start bringing the humans back. And uh, I also um, am usually an honored vintner at the Chesapeake Bay Wine Classic, which is awesome. They treat us so well there. It's such a great event, and I can't wait can't wait to get back to that. So the Barrel Burner Chardonnay, final final summation. I think for a sub $20, really sub 15, about $15 uh, Chardonnay, kind of in that La Crema sort of um, price point, I think you're getting a little more intensity. I think you're getting some beautiful broad flavors and characters. I think this wine uh, is drinkable for a geek, absolutely, because it's got good acidity and it's got sort of good verve and the way that cleanses the palate. But I think it's very much going to be an incredibly popular wine. If I was thinking about having some friends over that were into wine, weren't into wine, but I wanted a Chardonnay that wouldn't break the bank, but I wanted to open six bottles just in a big ice bucket and let people hit it like it owes them money, this would be an incredibly good, uh, a, a good one to go with. If I wanted to go a little bit more expensive, I would probably uh, upgrade up to the Jay Wilkes, which is a little leaner, it's a little more, um, it's a little more elegant, a little more complex. Um, and of course, uh, you also have uh, the Barrel Burner, or excuse me, the Ballard Lane Chardonnay, which just got a uh, 91 point score on the Wine Enthusiast. It's also incredibly rich and broad, and all those wines are available at Miller, MillerFamilyWines.com. <sighs> Beautiful Chardonnay. I hope you're drinking something absolutely delicious. So let me take just a little bit of uh, just a moment to make sure I'm catching up with everybody. And Brett's in the house, and Ian's here, and Bob, and Dave, and Nick, and Zen Man. Good to see you again, and Dave. Good to see you, Dave and John and Jolie still in the house. Love it. Uh, and uh, hello, Phil. So good to have you here again. Love it, love it, love it. Michelle Shin's in the house as well. All right. You got some 17 Barrel Burner Cab Solve. I was about to open a bottle of the Cab too, but then I thought opening two wines tonight might be a little intense because once I finish the first wine, I'm, I'm normally not drinking too much, but I'm going to try to change that. Because um, if I'm going to encourage and enable uh, day drinking, I should certainly be doing it myself. Will there be a wine dog appearance? Oh yeah, and uh, the uh, wine dogs too does have some of our uh, our greyhounds in it from Clo Pepe. But yes, you will definitely see some dogs during the wine and wine and dogs episode in a couple Mondays, and I'll definitely put that into the schedule so you guys can see. And Don, Don Ward, good to see you, brother. I'm so glad you're here. Love it. If the residual sugar is not perceptible, what's the advantage of that versus fermenting dry? Good, good question, Phil. Um, residual sugar affects the mouthfeel and also the aromatics of a wine. If you want a little bit of extra confectionery aroma, a couple grams of residual sugar plus almost no wines, especially in the broad market, are put into the broad market at bone dry. Generally, people don't like bone dry wines. They talk dry, they drink sweet. So what we're noticing is most of the most popular brands in the broad market generally are somewhere between uh, two and five grams of residual sugar. So what we'll do is we'll use Mute, which is uh, sterilized raw grape juice with all the sugar in it, and use Mute to uh, raise the residual sugar and taste for the sweet spot. So we do this basically by uh, raising the residual sugar by a half a gram or one gram per liter, which is almost imperceptible to the human palate, and then taste them blind, coated, and then choose our favorite coated glasses and then have a conversation with three or four other winemakers, and then we uh, find consensus, and once the consensus is reached, we 
try to break that consensus, and when we find that we can't break the consensus, we usually end up between two and two and a half grams of residual sugar. Of, of course, most people don't like to talk about residual sugar in their wine. They'll say, oh no, these wines are bone dry. Yeah, they're lying to you in general, unless, unless they're incredibly special wines made in a very, very special style to really encourage that absolute bone dry character. Also, yes, 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 that's really important to mention too. Nick came out with a really good point too, is if you're drinking German Riesling, Aust Austrian Riesling, um, uh, Alsatian Riesling or whatever, um, if the acid of those wines is incredibly high, and this works in champagne as well, if the acid is so screaming that it really just rips the cheek lining or it strips you know, the enamel off your teeth, um, you can leave a little residual sugar in the wine and it balances it. So that's really important to understand. That if we have a wine that's incredibly high acid, leaving a little bit of residual sugar in the wine plays this beautiful dance within our palate and it makes tension, like a good Disney movie, good guy, bad guy, parent dies early in the film, that has nothing to do with wine, but having tension and uh, that sort of um, back and forth between acid and sugar is really sort of uh, you know, what drives sort of antagonism, protagonism back and forth in your mouth as you drink wine. We don't think about it, but if it happens, we notice it. That's, that's absolutely correct. Cool, cool, cool. And we got uh, John drinking up some Smashberry Rosé. Um, I hope that stuff lasts a while because I need to drink that all the way through summer. Good, good stuff. Awesome. So we've got a really good crowd out tonight. Really appreciate all of you guys uh, hanging out with me for a little while. Um, and uh, what we should do, uh, talk a little bit, uh, make a transition a little bit into barrels. Um, I think I've got everybody's question and I think I've seen just about everyone uh, who's in the house. I generally don't announce folks in Instagram because it's not real names. I kind of, I don't know what, you know, capture the moment. Yay. You know, so I mean, follow these people, right? Uh, Dead Lioness. And we've got... Uh, uh, CF Toronto and Wine Chick 7, welcome. So glad you're here. Uh, and uh, so, for instance, yeah, that's, you know, I won't go through them all, but basically that's what I'm talking about. So why don't we talk a little bit about barrels? It's about, uh, it's about uh, 5.15, so we had a nice little conversation about Chardonnay. If you have any other questions about Chardonnay, about its production, how oak influences it. Um, but let's jump into barrels, and really the barrel situation can start with Chardonnay because I think Chardonnay is the wine that American, consumer, American consumers expect to taste oak. Um, in general, most uh, Chardonnays produced in California do use oak. Um, I was making stainless steel Chardonnay at Clopepe Vineyard starting in 2000 vintage and made uh, 15 uh, vintages of stainless steel Chardonnay. Uh, with my wife working at Clopepe. So I think we might have been the first stainless steel Chardonnay to be produced in, uh, in Santa Barbara County and uh, certainly in the Santa Rita Hills. In 2001, one year later, uh, Melville uh, produced their Enox uh, stainless steel Chardonnay. But I really do like, to a certain extent, how oak influences Chardonnay, but not to reduce the acid, to make it sweeter, to make it more flavorful. What I really love about how oak influences Chardonnay is how oak actually breathes and allows some oxygen ingress through the pores of the wood from the outer sort of uh, atmosphere into, uh, into contact with the wine. And if you can allow small amounts of oxygen to slowly leak through the barrel into the wine, that increases the flavor, uh, it increases the uh, richness of the wine and can give the wine just a little bit of extra uh, air in the times where it's needed. Um, certainly a uh, barrel fermentation matters. Uh, it's a real pain in the butt to ferment Chardonnay in barrels because you got to put, you know, 50 barrels, 100 barrels, 1,000 barrels, you know, on the floor, fill them all up with juice, two thirds the way, add your yeast, add your nutrients. And then as the, whoop, as the wine ferments, basically you're going to basically, um, uh, it's going to be uh, picking up a little bit of oxygen through, uh, through uh, you know, the, the hole in the bung, a uh, hole in the barrel, which of course we call a bung. And, uh, and that's really going to have an influence on the, on the character and the flavor of the wine, certainly. Uh, barrel fermentation is expensive, it's labor intensive, but the greatest Chardonnays in the world all basically use that barrel fermentation technique from my perspective. Good Chardonnay can be made without barrel fermentation, but the best Chardonnays in the world almost always have that barrel fermentation unless they're Chablis or they are stainless steel specific. And then of course that's exactly what we would expect out of them. Um, so barrels though, so when was the first oak barrel created? 
Well, if we give the idea of a barrel a little bit of latitude, we can go back a lot further than I thought. Um, my original idea was the Celts and the Gauls uh, go back and forth. If you want to talk to Dr. Patrick McGovern, he may give you a different, uh, different answer uh, than another wine scientist, but it's always the Celts and the Gauls that first put wine in barrels. I'll give it to the, uh, to the Gauls, but maybe had some Celtic influence. But we can go way, way back further than that. In fact, the earliest archaeological evidence that we have of using wooden staves and uh, shaving them so they basically create basically um, a liquid uh, tight seal. So something that you could make and then fill with something and it wouldn't leak out. It goes back to almost 2600 BCE. So 2,600 years before the Common Era, you, we, had, um, we have archaeological evidence and we also have um, artistic evidence on the cartouches that we have seen in ancient Egypt that almost uh, in 2,600 years, uh, 2600 years uh, before the Common Era, we had tubs. And these tubs were basically uh, storage units made uh, from wooden staves that were held together by bands. Now, if we push forward a little bit longer, uh, around 1900 BCE. So we're talking really about a full 4,000 years ago at the end of the Chalcolithic, moving into um, sort of the Iron Age. We had uh, clear evidence, both archeological and artistic, that um, wooden staved tubs were used for the crushing uh, and the maceration of, of a, a grape wine in ancient Egypt. So certainly the idea of a barrel and bringing wood together with some type of a strong band uh, and then probably soaking it with liquid until the bands really kind of like married together to a point where they were uh, liquid. Um, you know, of course, maybe they would drip or they would leak a little bit, but they would always probably figure out, you know, how to shore that up as much as they could. But these tubs were being used, uh, wooden tubs were being used um, basically uh, during, um, you know, in ancient Egypt uh, 4,000 years ago, which I found find absolutely fascinating. So the first, um, first archaeological evidence that we have for actual barrels, for uh, barrels that were being used for the transport of certain materials, uh, was about 300 BCE. And that was definitely the Celts and the Gauls. And uh, eventually what ended up happening is they made pretty good barrels, uh, pretty good, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, that could hold lots of different materials. There were certainly two different qualities of barrels. There were barrels that were meant to carry dry goods uh, that didn't have to be watertight. And those were probably uh, the younger uh, coopers uh, and the ones that were just starting out would probably make stuff for coins or, uh, you know, rough nails um, or, or grain or corn or whatever, whatever it was, right? Or barley, what, what, whatever it was, you could put it in a barrel. But if you wanted to put like fish or you wanted to put uh, water or you wanted to put grog or you wanted to put wine in a barrel, well, you better have amazing skills in your cooperage. Even today, wine barrels still leak and we've been making them what, for over 4,000 years? So certainly barrels, you know, the, the, the craft of making a barrel is not easy. Were these original barrels uh, probably toasted? Probably not. They probably were actually probably more like uh, coated with resin, uh, tree resin, oil, some, something that would actually help them become um, uh, uh, watertight. And I think what would probably, it's, it's easy to argue that certain resins uh, showed that they would give the wine or whatever uh, liquid we would put in an off flavor. So the resins that uh, kind of arose to the top uh, for sealing barrels like terebinth, um, the terebinth tree produces uh, the same resin that makes retsina, was probably used not only for fixing um, uh, sort of amphorae, but also for shoring up leaks in those barrels. And of course, you can take a little piece of wood and uh, nail it into a little, uh, we call them styles, you pop a little style into a leaking barrel and it basically goes into the hole and basically uh, protects it from, from continuing to leak. So the interesting thing is in the first century CE, the Gauls and the, uh, the Gauls and the Celt and the Celts, I almost said Celts, I'm a Laker fan, it's the Celtics, damn it. The, the Gauls and the Celts were absolutely the superior barrel building culture 
But what the Romans noticed is, you know, you could carry an amphorae, right, and stack them in boats, and it worked just fine. But when you really had, uh, you know, uh, 220 liters of something, and you wanted to move it from place to place, the greatest thing about a barrel is you can roll it. You can stack it. This is what we don't understand, and this is what no winemakers talk about the history of, of, of wine barrels, that wine barrels became so popular because they were so efficient, not only efficient in how much stuff you could stick in them. Remember, it's not only just what you can fit through a hole. You can pop, you can take the top two or three, or maybe even just one, depending on how the barrel is made, a hoop off the barrel, open the entire you know, 225 liter, 60 gallon, 60 gallon hogshead open, fill it from the top, and then pop the head back in, put the bands back on, knock the knock the, uh, the bands down a little bit to give it a little bit of tension, boom, you've got a barrel full of something. And then uh, if you gotta get it up a gangplank, think about you know 60 gallons or 220 liters of something, and two guys, very successful and strong, uh, you know, strong men on the, on the docks could push that barrel right up a gangplank onto the barrel, uh, onto the boat, boat into the hold, and then the barrels could either be racked or stacked uh, and then there was a really amazingly efficient way of moving dry goods, metal goods, coins, uh, fish, fish sauce, um, you know, liquid, whatever liquid you're talking about, as long as it was a really, really good barrel, it would absolutely work. So let's, we're going to take a long trip through time. Uh, uh, there's a couple other things there. I'm trying to kind of hit the bullet points and move past uh, the Enlightenment. So uh, past the Enlightenment, which usually, usually is, is talked about in the 16th and 17th century, oak was really hard to come by. So barrels kind of were not made very much um, before the 19th century, of course, the 1800s. Uh, why? Boats. So the best wood was always used for boats because boats in Europe were absolutely necessary for uh, the development of imperial cultures. And if you're... European country didn't have a standing navy that could keep you in the game, you would be uh, liable to lose out on tons of treasure, you know, you know, tons of influence, tons of, uh, tons of property, and the chance you know, uh, to do all the horrific and uh, terrible things uh, that many of these cultures did during their imperialist um, centuries. So the issue was is uh, barrels just weren't very made or used very much in, in the winemaking that led up to modern winemaking. So in the 19th century, we learned to start making boats out of metal. And uh, wasn't all at once, but what it did do is it freed up just enough oak that that oak became um, inexpensive enough that it started showing up in wineries. A barrel maker started practicing the craft a little bit more because the cost of the materials to make these barrels were generally less expensive. So I would say in the 18th, 19th, and even uh, a good chunk of the 20th or the 19th and the 20th centuries, um, up to 1945, most of the oak that was being used for the production of wine barrels that were being used in France, Italy, um, uh, sometimes even Greece, uh, you know, uh, Spain, all these places were, were really being uh, sourced uh, from Eastern European vineyards. Eastern European forests. So they would be from uh, Hungary, uh, Hungarian oak. They would be Croatian. They would be Russian. The tree that makes these barrels uh, is called Quercus robur, R-O-B-U-R. Quercus meaning oak and the robur, whatever the hell robur means in, uh, in Latin. But the most important thing to understand really is that that oak gave a specific flavor profile that was not exactly the same as French oak, but it was considered superior. Um, generally in 19th and early 20th century, the best oak that you could buy was really going to be Hungarian. And Hungarian coopers were the best in the world, the Hungarian barrels being used for wine. Some of these barrels, even from the 19th century, are still some of these huge puncheons and some of these huge standing tanks that, you know, had been uh, created in Hungary and, and um, decorated to look so beautiful. They're still some of these wine, uh, some of these old barrels that I've seen at the Marchese di Barolo in uh, you know, in the Longue in, in northern Italy. Sometimes you can still see these barrels because they were so well made. Um, but then the big moment, you know, why, how, how did we go from celebrating Eastern European and Hungarian oak to go completely kind of a 180 turn and say French oak is superior? And the answer is basically necessity and the end of World War II. 
So all of, all of you know, most of, I would probably say, and this is just a guess, maybe 75 to 80% of all the barrels that were being used uh, before World War II in the greatest French uh, chateaus uh, and wineries uh, was Hungarian, was Eastern European. Um, and then when the Iron Curtain fell at the end of World War II, suddenly they lost their access to Eastern European oak. And as a result, they said, well, we've got these beautiful, long, tall trees in our forests, you know, of, you know, uh, you know limousine and uh, Trancé and Bertrange and, uh, you know, all these beautiful forests that make these beautiful, have these beautiful trees. But they didn't know these, these forests weren't necessarily known as being perfect wine barrel forests. But what they did is they'd go out and they started experimenting with French wood. And remember these, so 45, 46, 47, especially 47, one of the greatest vintages in the, in the history of the world in France. And guess who was coming home after, you know, around that same time after tasting some of these uh, wines that had started to be used um, with French oak, the French oak flavored French wines. First of all, they probably felt pretty good about being French at that moment instead of being in the Vichy occupation of Nazi Germany. Um, and Marshal Patin doing everything he possibly could to keep French people alive by being cowards. Um, as a result, I think the French were really proud that they were using French oak and also they realized they had something really special here. Not only were the grapes of France some of the greatest in the world, but these French forests were starting to produce barrels once they got their, their act together that were producing some of the best flavors they'd ever tasted. Obviously, uh, the Cooper's art included at that time toasting the wood to bring out a roasty, toasty, sort of spicy, uh, smoky aroma in the wine. And that was probably kind of perfected probably between uh, the end of World War II. So toasting became much more important. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, coopering and the cooperage of the barrels became very important and all the French forests started to be used in these French barrels that were making the French wines that the American GIs were drinking and bringing back home with them. The love they had found at the end of World War II in Europe, tasting these wines, specifically French wines and specifically wines that had used French oak. So, you know, so there is certainly a uh, part of the story is the uh, American love of toasted French oak and wine theoretically drives a lot of a, a lot of why oak continues to be as popular as it is in wine and why, damn it, you know, California winemakers constantly sort of legitimize the flavor of domestic wine with that French accent. Is it Californian or is it French? It has a little flavor of the France. This partially upsets me, you know. I have not gone to the point where I start using uh, coastal red oak to make barrels because it would be awful and the flavors probably would just taste like kind of a burnt tri-tip. Um, you know, burnt ends being what they are, someone should try it, it's just not going to be me. But the idea here really is that oak is anti-terrorial, I'm using anti-bacterial, it, it takes the wine away from the place where it was grown because there's not many places uh, within oak forests that also produce wine. So it changes the flavor of the wine. So are we learning more about American wine by putting French oak into it? No. Should we be putting American oak into it? Well, if you talk to Paul Draper, you know, I mean, his wines, you know, uh, um, you know, at Ridge have always used 100% French uh, American oak. He said, I, at the beginning, he said, I am not going to make faux Bordeaux. That is one of the bravest American winemaking statements in the history of American wine. To say, what is American wine without the French accent? Well, I mean, you can make anything you want in stainless steel. In fact, I always say, one of my sort of, uh, sort of favorite sort of, um, you know, uh, sort of, maybe I'm being a bit, a bit of a bedlamite, uh, but let's talk about bedlam. Let's just say, hey, what if, what if in American wine, you had to make wine for you had to make sound wine for five years in a row before you got a license to use oak. So you would have to understand the flavors and the terroir of your region before you start gumming it up and messing it up with a bunch of oaky flavors. So I strongly believe that if you're a home winemaker looking or a young winemaker, you should really get your chops down. Um, you know, it's sort of like if you're a singer, you should probably learn to perform live before you start messing with auto tune. And if you're a winemaker, damn it, you should know how to make really, really damn good wine in glass, stainless steel, concrete, um, you know, what, what have you, aluminum, doesn't matter. But if you can make great wine without oak influence, then once you start integrating oak, 
you know, into, it, it's sort of like using bright colors or, or some type of glitter as an artist. Like you, you don't want to make your, the paintings that establish your own style and your own themes with, with glitter. Um, the glitter is obviously going to distract from your true artistry. And I think uh, oak is the same way. It can give a, a lot of delicious flavor to a wine, but it can also take the wine away from the place and the character that it is. Um, are we all still trying to make faux French wines? To a certain extent, we are. Some, you know, I mean, if you're using carbonic maceration on Gamay, you're sort of approximating the flavor of a Nouveau Beaujolais. If you're putting a bunch of new French oak on your Chardonnay, you're approximating the flavors of the Cote de Bone uh, and uh, white Burgundy. Um, again, we should drink what we love and we love what we drink. So part of me wants to say, if you love the flavor of French oak, there's a lot of French lumberjacks that are very, very happy with you. And let's not, let's not, Let's not move away to what you want. I used to not. I used to hate hoppy beer. I've learned to love hoppy beer. So now, hop farmers and I will get along. Um, you know, my my uh, barrel salesman used to call me all the time, and say, "Oh, you need some more uh, some more barrels for your Chardonnay." I'd say, "Yeah, you might remember last year I don't put new oak in my Chardonnay. Uh, I think I started buying one new demi barrel, which is the best smelling oak on the planet Earth. If you ever find a demi barrel." Um, you can say, well, Wes Hagen said I should pull that bung hole and stick my nose deep in that bung and smell the greatest smell in, in the entire wine industry in the flavor of oak. Um, if you've never smelled a brand new, fresh Demi barrel, uh, they're made in Merceau, France, and I think the smell of them, or a Francois Ferrer uh, barrel uh, with a little bit of uh, medium plus toast, it's just the aromas of those new barrels are just wonderful. You know, here's a cool trick. Contact, look up on the internet. Um... Uh, um, oak staves or oak adjutants for professional winemakers and find the companies. I won't tell you which companies so they can't sue me, but find the companies that make um, oak beads, oak chips, little oak staves, oak spirals for, uh, for um, large production wine companies. Write them an email and lie that you are the winemaker for some winery. And uh, if you live in uh, Kansas or you know maybe Missouri or something, um, use you know try to if you know someone at a winery, use their address with your name so they can ship them there and ask for samples. This is the coolest thing in the world. Whenever I do my wine education, when I'm teaching people the flavor and the different flavor profiles of American oak, French oak, Hungarian oak, Russian oak, I get the chips and I get the little staves in these little bags that they send me. And then what we do is not only will I break those out and let people kind of scrape them and smell the oak to get an idea of the difference in the high vanilla, coconut, and dill content of an American oak, Quercus alba, as opposed to the Quercus robur from France, which has lower vanilla from Hungary, which has higher vanilla in Russia, maybe even higher vanilla. Temperature, um, you know, climate, all this stuff really impacts oak. And then the coolest thing I do is I do oak sampling where um, a lot of these uh, packs will come and say, if you put this amount of oak in one bottle of wine, um, it will give you the equivalent of a thousand gallons with a hundred pounds of oak, which will be, or one new barrel, uh, even if you just let the uh, oak sit in the wine overnight and then you sieve off and remove the oak and then you can smell and actually drink the wine as it's been influenced by those various oaks. And you can do it for free. You do it by free by asking for samples. It's not gonna hurt these people. They make a lot of money and they're cutting down trees for a good reason and they're toasting this oak and they will send it to you for free if you ask for samples. So that is my um, slightly devious uh, suggestion for all of you folks for the day. And, and uh, Tammy and Ruben, Ruben, it's good to see you guys, uh, awesome. And then uh, Nick said he agreed that oak should be utilized for complexity, micro-oxygenation. Uh, micro I clearly need more alcohol in me. I can't say microox. I definitely haven't been drinking enough. However, uh, that comes through barrel aging, and uh, and uh, Nick loves these flex tanks. They're these beautiful tanks that have a slight amount of ability to allow oxygen ingress, and then obviously using oak, the oak adding the oak within it is all, all obviously there's going to probably be a little bit of air within the pores of the wood that's going to probably have an influence. What else did I want to say about about barrels? Um, oh, the fact really that the actual size of the barrel really was the hogshead, the, uh, the barrel that's used 99% of the time in wine, in the wine industry is 55 to 63 gallons, depending on if it's a Bordeaux style barrel, a Burgundy barrel, or what have you. And then um, 
Uh, but it's really all based on that 60 gallon, 225 liter size is perfect for two persons to move that barrel um, by rolling it. So um, clearly the, the sort of uh, barrel shape and it being a little bulging in the, in the center is really to help it roll. And it protects things. That's, that's one reason. Why would you put grain? Why would you put fish? Why would you put something like coins in a barrel? Is because A, no one can see what's inside. And B, it's pretty darn hard, especially if you if you smack that barrel down and it doesn't have a bunghole. And you've basically opened the head, filled it with gold coins, uh, put it back down. A, no one will know what's inside. It'll feel heavy. It'll be hard to move around and steal um, if you don't have a crew to help you. And C, uh, it's going to protect it, so you're not going to actually see it. So that protective element um, was really, really important. Um, oh, and the Romans used to use them as weapons. So the 55 gallon hogshead would be um, filled uh, and sealed uh, with a pitch inside of it and then coated with pitch, set on fire, put in a catapult and they would basically launch uh, 55 gallons of uh, a burning pitch barrel uh, either at other ships or uh, at, um, basically when they, were, when they were going to war. And trust me, if a 55 gallon burning uh, barrel of pitch hit anything that's flammable in a city, you are going to have a conflagration in that city and that's gonna really move move the dial militarily. And I might not wanna go uh, against the Romans knowing that they're gonna be firing 55 gallon flaming pitch barrels at you. Um, and then, um, yeah, just, and the two various kinds of oak, we have the American oak, Quercus alba, uh, which means white oak. And that Quercus alba is uh, generally um, along the Mississippi River, basically, really uh, from uh, Mississippi all the way down, uh, following, the, uh, following the Mississippi all the way. You can uh, great, great white oak in Missouri, um, all the way down into even places like um, Louisiana and, and uh, Mississippi. But in general, I think Missouri has a reputation of maybe producing the best uh, American oak. American oak is definitely gonna have uh, French oak, like I said, it's a little more toasty, a little more complex, a little more elegant, a little more understated, spicy, toasty. Um, especially at, at higher levels of toast, espresso and bacon fat, especially in burgundy barrels, uh, especially from Francois Ferrer, from Allier and Troncé for us. And then uh, American toast, American oak, tends to have uh, the flavors that are also brought out by the toasting, uh, specifically uh, coconut um, and vanilla, higher amounts of vanilla than you would get in the Quercus Robur from Europe. And then the one thing that always tips me off that I'm tasting a wine that has American oak, and that's a little hint of dill. Um, unless you're drinking uh, red burgundy from Von Romani and then it just has dill in it without the oak, which, you know, in American Pinot Noir, dill is a, a big problem. It's, it, it would be a fault, but in Von Romani, it means that the bottle's worth $5,000. So it's, it's a little here, a little there. Cool. So we had a 45-minute session. I, I don't want to go too long. We all have things to do, places to go. I hope you learned something about oak and wine and barrels. If anyone has any questions, please let me know. We had Zin Man. Red oak is not used because the grain is so wide and open, not tight like white oak. Very difficult to make. I could imagine um, you, could, you might be able to make maybe like a jacuzzi out of red oak, but yeah, if you tried to make a barrel, um, it would be pretty damn hard to keep it from leaking. That would certainly, certainly be hard. Um, PA oak used. PA oak used. Not exactly sure what you're asking, James, but uh, let's see. In many places in Europe, they still use American bourbon barrels. Ah, uh, no. I would say that the cost of shipping over aged bourbon barrels would be very difficult. I don't know any wineries specifically. I'm sure there's some that are making a bourbon barrel wine, but they probably get made fun of quite a bit by uh, their winemaking friends. Oh, you're bringing over American oak. You know, um, in general, I would say that that would be incredibly rare. Uh, I'd be very surprised if there was um, a lot of bourbon barrels. We do make a bourbon barrel cab at Jay Wilkes, and we use uh, it's a collab with uh, Buffalo Trace. So very happy to be using Buffalo Trace. There. Oh, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. I'm sure there's white oak in Pennsylvania. I'm sure you can make some decent barrels with it. Um, the thing is, is uh, oak works a lot like grapes. It really shows terroir. It really shows the climate. It really shows uh, the weather. It shows it, it shows the patterns of weather. Um, and of course, the barrel has to, or the tree has to be, and the staves have to be, uh, have really, really um, significantly, um, uh, significant uh, amounts of tight grain. So it'll hold liquid, and then it, with a toast, it'll give some delicious flavor back. I, I've never tasted uh, any wines made with 
uh, Pacific white oak, but or uh, Pennsylvania white oak, excuse me. I sort of have a West Coast frame of mind, which is not a problem at all. Which reminds me of the New York state of mind, which reminds me of JFK's statement. New York is not a noun, it's a verb. I can't wait, I've never been to Manhattan, so maybe when this is all over, uh, herd immunity will be reached there probably before Santa Maria. But I wanna make sure everyone stays safe. If you go out, wear a mask, you look smart. My wife and I were talking about this, people that don't wear masks, we, it reminds us of seeing like old people smoking. It's like, it's not like you're gonna die today, but is that the best idea for your ongoing health is to inhale burning tobacco smoke and blow it out? And I used to smoke and my lungs are not the greatest, unfortunately, I wish, I wish uh, they were, but uh, you know, 10 years of smoking has probably done some some, done some damage, but you know the same way that I'm sure a lot of these people that aren't wearing masks are probably going out thinking, oh, look how bitchin' I look. You know, it's it's like it's like you know driving a big pickup truck. Look how macho I am. You know, I don't, I'm not even afraid of death. What I see is, I'm stupid and I want to kill my grandmother. That's pretty much what I see. So take care of someone in your life. Take care of your family. Take care of your friends, your cohort, your workers. Find someone in your neighborhood that might need a little help. Uh, see what you can do for them, bring them a bottle of wine, bring them a nice card, write something in chalk on their sidewalk. We're loving to see all the kids in our neighborhood are making these beautiful signs telling us to have faith and you know to be strong and uh, strength is, is, is sexy. So let's, let's just go with that. Um, support the people around you, support um, justice in the United States. And I will say it loud, I will say it proud that black lives matter and I hope you agree. And I hope we can find a way to rebuild this country um, in the same way that we rebuild showing the people that helped build this country as slaves, that we are willing to show them that we're as willing to work as hard for their, uh, for, for their well-being and their flourishing as once they did for us. So um, it's a weird way of saying it, but I hope you understand what I'm saying. Uh, let's get out there and make a difference. Let's change this world. Let's change this, you know, as this world is falling apart. It's our job to put it back together. We have power. We have agency. Let's get out there and do it. So have a glass of wine, relax, and let's get back out changing the world tomorrow. Hope everyone had a great show. I certainly did. And we'll see you all on Friday with Jonathan Nagy, the new director of winemaking at the Miller Family Wine Company. Yes, we got him from the Jackson family, and we got him from Byron after 20 years. We're going to talk about Ken Brown. We're going to talk about his time uh, at Jackson family. We're going to talk about Santa Maria. We're going to talk about how the hell are you going to make, you know, Zinfandel and Cabernet from, from Paso guy when you've just been making Santa Maria wines all this time. We're going to talk a little bit about making the transition from being a cool climate winemaker to making wines from different climates. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And if you've never seen Jonathan, he is an awesome dude and we are going to bring some energy. It's going to be fun. And I just put together the questions and I just put together the speed round. Don't miss it. It's going to be fun. So get out there. And now uh, it's your job uh, to do some uh, independent study in a day and evening drinking. I hope you all had a great evening. And uh, let's do everything we can to take care of each other. Have a great night. Talk to you soon.